Come on, lift a praise to him. God is worthy. He's been so good all of our lives. Every breath we take is because of him. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Can you lift your voice and sing it with us? Goodness of God. I love your 
more time, sing it with us. All my life, Jesus, you have been so faithful. serve a great and mighty God, why don't you help me love him right now? Would somebody lift up the name of Jesus in this place? If he's ever been good to you, why don't you lift up the name of Jesus in the house tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time, can we offer a hand clap of praise unto the Lord? Mighty God, mighty God. I mentioned it in the prayer room earlier, but I'm going to say it again because it's still true. It feels good on a Wednesday night in the house of the Lord. Anything could happen tonight. Anything can happen when God gets in the mix of things. Amen. Thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. What a beautiful crowd on a Wednesday night. I give you honor for being here. If this is your first time here, we give you honor. Thank you for joining us here at FPC. Amen. As our ushers are making their way forward tonight, there's a couple things we'll make sure you have on your calendar. Memorial Day weekend is just around the corner. It is coming up quick and in a hurry on Sunday, May 28th. And we will be doing our annual uh, Memorial Day cookout on that day. Somebody say hallelujah. And if we have any luck, we can get Brother Orlando or Brother Boaz somewhere in the vicinity of a grill. And we are, we are going to have an awesome time. I want to remind you, we will only have one service on Sunday, May 28th. We'll have our normal Sunday school and service at 1045. And we're asking each family to bring one meat to be uh, cooked for your family and bring two side dishes. And bonus points if you bring dessert. And man, this might be a little bit early, but if, if you know somewhere where you can get good persimmons and you bring persimmon pudding... I will love you forever, I promise. And if not, I'll still love you anyways. But put that on your calendar, May 28th is Memorial Day Sunday. And this Sunday we are excited to celebrate all the precious mothers here at FPC. Amen. Sunday morning we are going to be celebrating Mother's Day. We will have a special gift for each mother. And we'll have an opportunity for photos um, with your family. It's a great time to, to bring aunts and grandmothers who normally wouldn't come bring them and let's have an awesome weekend here at FPC and one more quick reminder we will not have prayer meeting here at FPC tomorrow night so please find a place and time to pray with your family at home but we will not have corporal prayer tomorrow night um, Thursday night but we'll be back in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning amen amen, amen. We want to give you an opportunity tonight to return your tithes and offering to the Lord. So would you help me just pray over this offering tonight? Father, we thank you for an opportunity to sow into the kingdom. I pray tonight that you would bless the gift and the giver, that you would multiply it for the use of your kingdom. And we will give you all the honor and glory for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Would you worship the Lord tonight with your tithes and offerings?
somebody shout hallelujah hallelujah if you know he's still a miracle working God would somebody shout in this place right now would somebody just shout yes yes I believe he's still working miracles he's still moving he's still changing lives praise God hallelujah we serve a mighty God church family amen brother Frank I you know I, I don't like rumors but I heard a rumor about you sir I heard some healing virtue got moving over you this weekend you haven't touched a cane since Sunday is that right brother I still believe he's a healer would somebody help me thank God for for letting healing virtue flow praise God Yes, yesterday at work, I, it was about 2 o'clock, we was ready to wind it up, and I got to feeling like a 50-year-old, and uh, got on the back of this skid, and it was broke. I didn't see the, the hole in the skid. My foot went through it, and I went sideways, and just happened to catch the cart, and I hit that cement floor like a linebacker, but I laid there, and I, I moved. I moved my hands. I moved my feet. Then I opened my eyes. Two guys got me up. I said, man, I'm good. And they said, then, then, then uh, a couple people said, man, you ought, to, you ought to sue them for money. I said, man, I'm rich already, bro. I don't need that money. I'm already rich, man. Hey, man, can we thank the Lord together, church family? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. Thank you for being here for midweek service tonight. We are in for a treat tonight. I am so thankful that my friend is going to be coming to preach the word to us. You know, I don't get to, to be in class in Sunday morning Bible class very often anymore. Um, mostly because the probability of donuts is slightly higher in youth class. But, but I miss getting to hear my friend teach. Every time Brother Gill teaches, I feel like I, I leave the service having increased in understanding and knowledge of the Word of God. Man, he is both a gentleman and a scholar, and I am so thankful that he is coming to preach the Word to us tonight. Would you help me welcome Brother Stephen Gill and the Lord. Give a hand clap to the Lord. Brother Jordan Fry, I did not know that's why you stopped coming to adult class. I can arrange donuts on Sunday morning, though. We'll do this thing full on charismatic. Oh, my. I am uh, thankful to be here with the, uh, They already got it for me. Man, you guys are on it. Um, thankful for this church and for our pastor and our pastor's wife. Um, it's hard to believe it's been seven years uh, that I've been here, but, um, you know, I think back kind of over the course of my entire life, and I've always got memories of Pastor and Sister TJ. I've got memories of people in this church, um, but seven years ago, this church took me in as one of their own, and uh, I cannot possibly tell you how much I love this church, and I love each and every one of you. Um, it's probably something that needs said more often, but I'm very thankful for all of you. And, um, you know, we, uh, we have an incredible pastor, incredible bishop, pastor's wife, and uh, we're blessed. And our youth pastor, Brother Jordan Fry, Sister Caitlin Fry. I know it's it's been said like 50 times over the last like week and a half, but I'm so happy for you guys. It's just incredible what God's doing, and um, and I'm excited for what God's going to do tonight. I uh, texted Brother Jordan yesterday telling him a little bit about what I was going to talk about, and I think I made him nervous, and uh, which is good. Um, keeping in line, you know, a week ago, I think it was today, Pastor preached from Genesis chapter 1. Is that right? A week ago today. And then Sunday, Brother Jordan Fry. Genesis, y'all wore out Genesis chapter one, so I thought I would change it up and go to Genesis chapter three. So the good news is it's going to be easy for you to find the book. Um, 
Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 1 is where I'm going to begin reading. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 1. It's a familiar reading. The Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Somebody say he's subtle. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, it starts with a question, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So here's the question posed. Whose report are you going to believe? God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Skipping down to verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall Bruise thy head, but, what does he say? And thou shalt bruise his heel. So for just a little while this evening, I want to talk to you from this thought. Subtle serpents and bruised feet. Subtle serpents and bruised feet. If we could put our Bibles down and pray over the remainder of our time together tonight. God, we are so thankful to be in your house this evening. Master, I pray that the word that goes forth today, God, let it not be in vain in anybody's life. I pray that every person who's come into this house this evening that is hungry to hear from heaven, God, I pray before they leave this place that your spirit would speak to them, Master. I've come tonight to encourage somebody, and I pray, God, that you would allow me to be a vessel, an instrument in your hand, God, that you can use. Lord, I want to be a conduit of the Holy Ghost. I pray that we would all be good soil to receive the word with gladness that you've prepared for this place, Lord, and we'll give you all the glory and all the honor for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said in Jesus' name. Why don't you give a great big hand clap to the Lord before you're seated? Subtle serpents and bruised feet. So snakes don't make very good pets. I don't know if you knew that. If you're somebody in this place that likes snakes, uh, you and I probably don't see eye to eye on very much. Um, Snakes are interesting. You know, my mother has a true phobia, an irrational fear. Well, some would say it's irrational. I guess you don't live as long as she has without a healthy fear of snakes. And so she, uh, she hates snakes. I remember when I was a kid, we had a babysitter before my, before my mother and my, my stepfather got married. We had a babysitter in Kokomo who her son had a terrarium upstairs. He was uh, probably in his mid-30s, uh, early 40s, and he took care of all kind of reptiles and tarantulas, and he had a ton of snakes. And I remember uh, he would get the snakes out when we would be uh, watching TV downstairs or eating our, 
snacks or whatever, he would get them out and he would, he would let the snakes kind of roam all over the living room. And so all kinds of snakes, racers and garter snakes. And he had a couple of pythons too. He had a really big yellow boa, a uh, big yellow python that he, would, uh, that he would let around the house. And it was just normal for them. But my mother, she didn't know all of this when she let uh, that woman start babysitting us. And, you know, one day she came to pick us up. My older brother and I are sitting in the living room with a big python on our laps, and my mother, I mean, she, she didn't come in the living room, but she was angry, she was freaked out, and I don't remember ever going back there after that uh, as far as babysitting goes. Uh, you know, I've, snakes, uh, we've, we, we understand, you know, that to keep a safe distance. I, Sister TJ, you might remember this, I don't know, but Hartford City Camp, a uh, long time ago, there was, uh, I, I don't know how old I was, probably 14 or 15 and uh, there was, in the boys' dorm, you know, there was a big field right there but next to the property. And, and uh, there was a, a large uh, rat snake that had got into the boys' dorm, and it just so happened to fancy my room. And uh, we didn't know that, you know, me and the guys, we were, I was staying uh, with some friends, Nick Meadows and Joe Meadows. And, and we, uh, we go into that, that room, and I, I kind of opened the door, and I thought I saw something coiled up behind the door, but I, I looked, and there's this, and I'm not exaggerating, there's pictures out there, about a six-foot, six-foot-three black rat snake that had got into our room, and I did the brave thing and shut the door immediately and got out of there. <laughs> the real man, Joe, you know, I mean, how he's country to the bone, he... Uh, he walked in there, and uh, he had just like a little piece of wood in his hand, and he walked in there and got in the face of that snake, and it started snapping at him. It was angry. He just banged it over the head with that piece of wood and got it by the head, and before he uh, sent it to be with Jesus, he, he uh, took a picture with it. That's how we knew how tall it was, and uh, you know, snakes don't make good pets. A, a recent study done by Oxford University on the subject revealed that while any, many animals living in the world have the capacity to be domesticated, snakes, according to Oxford, have never developed the parts of the brain necessary to show affection or concern for human companions. Because of this, it is not recommended that you keep snakes as pets, for while you may impose your thoughts and your emotions and your affections on the reptile, what you interpret as a response to your love is often nothing more than the cold and severe survival instincts of the beast, and while you may come to love them, they will never and can never love you back. I'll say it one more time. No matter how much affection you oppose on the serpents, they can never and they will never love you back. In our opening text, there is a serpent that we know as the devil. We call him Lucifer. We call him Satan, and he shows himself to humanity for the first time, but we know that before man was created, he was in the earth already. It is in Luke chapter number 10 that Jesus tells us that he beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven before the worlds were. And the prophet Isaiah gives us a picture of what may have happened in that day that Jesus spoke of in Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse 12. The prophet is writing and he said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And I've spent most of my life believing this principle that because of his envy towards his creator and his hatred of humanity, it has always been the strategy of Satan to do whatever he has to do to make you and to make me more like him. It has always been his strategy since the beginning of time to convince humanity to be just like him. Why? Because he knows that he has but a short time and he's thinking in his heart, if I'm going down, I'm taking them with me. And since the Garden of Eden, he has been trying to disrupt and he has been trying to destroy your relationship with your creator. And in trying to make mankind question whether or not they could become as gods, they become not like God, but like Lucifer. In Genesis chapter number three and verse one, I read to you, the scripture said that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God 
had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God not said, has he said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So his strategy, first and foremost, was to get Eve to question and debate and to debate in her mind the boundaries and the borders that God had set for humanity through his word. It doesn't begin with direct opposition. It does not begin with direct opposition, but rather, he does not try to get us to hate the words, but to question if the lines that are drawn are really drawn where God says that they are. And his strategy isn't to get us to become immediately active opposers of the word of God, because the truth is, if he can make you ask the question, then the door is open for a new opinion to begin to form. He doesn't start with Eve by saying, God's wrong and I'm right. He doesn't begin by saying, I know that you can do this and you should listen to me. He begins simply by asking the question, are you sure that his word really says and are you sure that God really means what he says that he means? And can I tell you, his strategy is no different in the lives of you and I today. That the devil works his hardest against the church to get us to question and to get us to twist and to get us to manipulate the words that God has spoken to us and ask the question, God, are you really going to do what you said you were going to do? God, are you really who your word says that you are? God, are the borders and the boundaries really where you said they're drawn? Can I tell you that God's word is forever settled in heaven and what he has said to you, he will perform. He is faithful to finish Every work that he starts, his word never returns void. His word will always, always, always come to pass. But he makes Eve question it. Verse number two, the Bible says that the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent says to the woman, no, you won't. God said, if we eat it, we'll surely die. And the serpent says, you will not surely die. So the serpent begins by making Eve question the boundary. And Eve explains her understanding of it. And then the serpent offers his own perspective. God said, you will surely die. But I say, you won't surely die. And here is the second challenge presented to Eve. Whose report are you going to believe? It really is that simple. I know we live in a world that thinks it's constantly searching for the truth. And they say that all they're doing is looking for the truth and that they just want the truth. But the truth of the matter is that God's word has forever and always been settled in heaven. And the truth is, is that if the serpent can begin to question, if he can begin to make you question and begin to make you ask questions about the word of God and justify your questioning and saying, well, maybe that's not really what it meant. And maybe that's not really when God said that's what he wanted. Maybe that's not really how he meant it. Then it's not very long before he can motivate you to start questioning and shaping your own opinions about what God really said. And so he begins to tempt Eve with, God, you won't actually surely die. And Eve thinks she's forming her own opinion. Yeah, that's, that's the first deception right there. Eve thinks that this is about her opinion. She thinks that she's making her own way. But the truth is, is that all the while it's the serpent speaking into her life. And sin is no different in the world today that people who think they're living life on their own terms and they think that they're living life their own way and they think that they've made their own rules. Can I tell you that since the beginning of time until now and until Jesus comes and even in eternity, you will always serve a master. There is no such thing as a person in this world who is walking their own way, who is doing their own thing, who has it all together, who has it all figured out. You are a servant of somebody. You are a servant of somebody. Thing, and you get to decide who you're going to serve. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10 and verse 8, the writer warned us, he said, he that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaks an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. 
There are people all over the world that think they've gotten away with breaking down the hedge. Because just like Adam and Eve, maybe not everything that could happen to them happened immediately. But all the while, the serpent is thinking, if I can just convince them that it's safe to reach over the boundary, if I can convince them that it's safe to reach over the border, it won't be very long before I've got my teeth in their hand. And they think that they're not going to die, but my poison's already working through them. It's already beginning to work in the form and so... It's the first line in the sand that the devil wants humanity to cross. He wants you to question this principle. Who in your life decides where the living and the dying happens? Who discerns the life from the death? Who's drawn the boundary in your life? Who sets the terms of the agreement? He wants you to ask the question. And so you've got to make up your mind first and foremost if you're going to live for God. You have got to make up your mind whose report you're going to believe about your life. You have got to get it settled in your heart that in spite of the evidence and in spite of the circumstances and in spite of what you might see with your natural eye and what you might hear with your ears, you have got to wake up every day and say, I am choosing to turn my face to the heavens. I am choosing to serve my creator. This is not about me. It's not about my will. It's not about what I think is right. I will put all of my trust in the Lord and lean not unto my own understanding. In verse, chapter number 3 and verse 6, the Bible says that Eve saw that the tree was to be desired. This is weird. The tree was to be desired to make one wise. And my question is, who told her that? The Bible paints the picture that Eve came to the conclusion on her own. But we know God never told her that this tree is to be desired to make one wise. But the longer that she listened to the serpent and the longer she listened to the words of her adversary, eventually it began to change her outlook on the things that were forbidden by God. The longer she entertained voices in her life that contradicted the voice of the Lord, it wasn't very long before she began to question It wasn't very long before she began to reinterpret the meaning. It wasn't very long before she began to change her outlook on the things that God had forbidden. What makes us change our minds about forbidden things, Brother Shaw? What makes us change our minds about things that God has said, don't do, don't go, don't walk that way, don't live that life? Don't, bring, don't, don't introduce that into your family. What is it that makes us change our outlook on those things? It's when we begin entertaining voices that tell us that you on your own are sufficient to know what the word really means. You don't need a God. You don't need a spirit to lead you. You don't need holiness. You don't need, you don't need the voice of the Lord. And you make up your own mind. And the tragedy is, is that most often we do start to make up our own mind. And our mind is flawed. So... It changes her outlook, and then the serpent begins to convince her that what God said would bring chaos and disorder and death into, the, into life. Maybe what it's really going to do is make me wiser. You know how many times I've heard that over the years? People that are just on the edge and are trying to take one step out of the body. They're trying to take one step out of the church. And their justification is always, well, I've just got to figure some things out on my own. And I've just got to do this for myself. And I've just got to, you know, I think I've just got to go through it on my, I've just got to, I've got to walk my way and I've got to do my thing. And, you know, I've got to figure this out. And the truth is, it is a lie from the pit of hell that you have to go into the world to be effective in this world. It is a lie from the pit of hell that says you've got to go into the world and live a hard life to have a good testimony. The truth of the matter is the greatest testimony you'll ever have is that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And when you came into his presence, he redeemed you forever. And forever you can walk in glory. Forever you can walk in redemption. That is the most powerful testimony you can ever have. You don't have to be the brave one and stare down the world. You don't have to be the brave one and stare down sin and say, well, I think I can do it on my own. I think I can handle it. It brings a lot of pain. It brings a lot of confusion into life. Chasing carnal wisdom and the wisdom of this world has and continues to have a corrupt influence on people all over the world. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 3. Paul was writing and he said, but I fear lest by any means, 
as the serpent beguiled Eve through his, there's that word again, through his subtlety. We'll get to that. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You know what the strategy of, this, of, you know what the strategy of our adversary is when it comes to false doctrine? Is to convince you that this thing is harder than it really is. Is to convince you that this thing is more complicated than it really is. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You don't, have to, you don't have to be one of those people that spends their life thinking, well, I've got to get some things right before I get in the presence of God. And I've got to get some things in order before I can do something for God. And I may, maybe one day I'll, when I have better understanding and maybe one day when I see things a little deeper. Listen, there is a simplicity that comes to living in Christ Jesus. And Paul is writing to the church and telling them, don't be deceived by the adversary just like that. That serpent who beguiled Eve and convinced her that things were not really as they are. I'm telling you that if you have Christ, you have everything that you need. There is not another gospel. There's not another doctrine. There's not another book. There's not another, uh, there's not another theology. There's nothing else that you need. This is why the writer could say, and you are complete in him. You are complete in Christ. You didn't come to Jesus and start a journey of adding on. You didn't come to Jesus, oh, well, I, you know, I was born again, but I've got a long way to go. No, if you are born again, you've made it. Now it's time to do what God has asked you to do. If you've been born again, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus and you've been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, God has put something in you to do in his kingdom. So, the serpent, I got thinking about this, this word subtle. And he is subtle. If it wasn't subtle, we probably wouldn't believe it. That's the problem with small lies. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Why? Well, because little foxes are harder to notice. Little foxes are harder to catch. They're harder to see coming. You know, we we live our lives proudly beating our chest that we'll never believe the big lies. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll never... Brother Wendell Evans, I'll probably never be a Catholic. I can tell you. Never. I'll never be a murderer. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm going to make a brave statement. I'll never be a murderer. Well, I'll never. It's never the big things, Brother Snow. But you know what can trip me up? It's the subtlety of the adversary that says, you'll almost make it. You might almost get, you know, things, things really aren't going to be what you think they're going to be. You know, you, you're probably not going to. Make it all the way. You might look like you're going to. You know, they don't have it all wrong. They've got some things right and they've got some things wrong. But, you know, let's meet in the middle somewhere. And, you know, they don't really listen. So maybe you should just shut your mouth. And the truth is, is that it's always just a little bit of truth mixed with a little bit of a lie. And that's exactly what the serpent did to Eve. The Bible says that he tells Eve, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Listen to me. He said, you shall be as Elohim. Now, for the longest time, I thought this probably just meant the creator God. You'll be as God. That's not really what he says, though. He says, you'll be as gods, lowercase g, plural. Why say it that way? Well, the truth is, it's a subtle statement. He knows that you'll be as the Elohim. You know, Lucifer is also Elohim. And that's the problem is the Bible says that the angels... Are Elohim. The angelic spirits, the messengers of God, they're Elohim. He says, and you're going to be like them. You're going to be like Elohim. You're going to be divine. You're going to be, maybe he's thinking like me. He says, you'll be as gods knowing good and evil. And it was certainly his design and his desire to make man like him. To make man in his own image. Remember this whole thing started when Lucifer said in his heart, I will be like the most high. You make the devil jealous. If I can leave, if you don't remember one thing I say tonight, I got a long way to go, short time to get there, but if you don't remember anything else I say, I want you to remember this. You are a constant reminder to the devil of who he will never be. 
Your life is a constant reminder to him that he has but a short time. You are a constant reminder to him that he's never going to be good enough. You are a constant reminder to him he can never be redeemed. And it's a thorn in his side to know that God loves you more than he loves him. And God has set you to be the apple of his eye, and he's condemned him to an eternity in torment. Can I tell you that you make the devil jealous? You stir up envy in him, and he's thinking, I'm, I know what I can do. I know how, I, I have a strategy. Because I know what got me cast out of heaven, trying to be like him. So I know, and if I begin to speak into their lives, you can be like the Elohim. Okay. But that's not really all that he says. Verse number seven I thought was interesting. You know, so Genesis chapter three and verse one, it said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And that word subtle is the Hebrew word arum. And when I was reading this this week, I noticed something. Verse number 7, after Eve has eaten of the fruit and Adam has eaten of the fruit, the scripture says that the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The scripture said the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And wouldn't you know it that this word naked, and the word we saw earlier in Genesis 3 and 1, subtle. This word, a room, naked, it comes from the same Hebrew word, Strong's H6191, a room, which also means subtle. In other words, when they disobeyed God, Adam and Eve took on the same qualities as the serpent who had deceived them. It said the serpent was more so, than, you know what that word means? It means that he is, he is with knowledge conniving. That he is with knowledge, he is with knowledge knowingly wicked. That he is with knowledge cunning. He is with knowledge subtle. And when the Bible says that the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened and they knew that they were naked, the word arum pops up again. And it means that as soon as they walked in disobedience, now... They took on a quality that before they didn't have because God never made them to know that they were naked. But in their disobedience, the Bible says that they came to the knowledge of their nakedness. And now they bear the image of somebody else. Now they've got the image of somebody else. And I can imagine the devil in that moment thinking to himself, when they knew that they were naked, I can imagine he said within himself, there it is. I've done it. I've ruined them, and I've ruined him. They are not in his image anymore. They're in mine. I can imagine the serpent in that moment, the pride that probably swelled up in him, that I've deceived them, and I've brought them not to where he is, but to where I am. And now they're more like me than they are like him. And he, for a moment, had to begin to celebrate. I have to believe that he was proud of himself. The Bible says that enmity would now exist between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve. What is the seed that comes forth out of this serpent? I'll tell you what it is. The seed that comes forth out of that serpent is when you and I become opposers of God. It's when you and I become opposers of the things of God. And for thousands of years, humanity was in the terrible position of enmity between themselves and God. There was an impasse that existed between man and his creator. Why? Because in the moment in the garden when Adam and Eve took the fruit that they were not supposed to take, the Bible says that there was a chasm created between them. The Bible says that God cries out, Adam, where are you? That this is now the moment that there's been separation. There's going to be enmity between thy seed and her seed. That there's going to be Something that divides my people from my holiness. And God sets an order in that moment. The product of that disobedience that set us on a collision course with righteousness for the rest of time. And I want to tell you that we are still in that fight until Jesus comes. The humanity is on a, an inevitable collision with the wickedness that is in this present world. But... God sets an order before the world was that when his image was to be disfigured in the beginning and when his image would be marred and when his image would be tainted, he would not leave it in that condition. 
And there would come a day when a child would be born in Bethlehem who would come to begin a new work. We've talked a little bit about subtle serpents. Now I want to tell you about bruised heels. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 12. We read all the time in the context of oneness, as we should, because it is. But I want you to see something. The Bible says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. I'm going to stop here first and tell you two things. Number one, you and I were made in the image of God. I think we all know that. We can all agree on that. But his image in the beginning, when Eve decided to disobey, that image was twisted. It was marred. It was disfigured. So Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and he lives this sinless life. And he walks the earth as the image of the invisible God. Only the difference between Jesus and you And the difference between Jesus and me is that his image is incorruptible. And that he is the, the Bible says, the pleroma, the totality, the express image of the invisible God. He is the image. And then it says something, and it says he's the firstborn of every creature. I've talked about it in our adult class a little bit, but I want to do a little bit of exercise with you. Why is it that the scripture calls Jesus the firstborn? Of every creature. I'm going to tell you why. Since the beginning of time, you get the impression all throughout the scriptures that there's a problem with the firstborn. We'll start first with Adam and Eve. Anybody know who Adam and Eve's firstborn was? Cain. Between Cain and Abel, who's the righteous one? Who's the wicked one? Congratulations, gold star. Move on. What about Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth? Who's the wicked one? Ham, yeah. Who's the righteous one? Shem, yeah. Abraham, his children. Who's his first natural son? Ishmael. But who's the child of promise? Who's the firstborn? Ishmael. Who's the righteous? Isaac, yeah. What about Isaac's kids? You got Jacob and Esau. Two nations are in thy womb. Who's the elder? Who's the younger? And what's the scripture say? The elder shall serve the younger. What about Jacob's sons? Anybody remember who his first kid was? Reuben, unstable as water, thou shalt not inherit. That's what Jacob said. Who was his youngest two kids? First, his first youngest son, Joseph, and then Benjamin, right? Who's the one that's remembered as wicked? Reuben. Who's the one that not only doubles a nation inside of him, Joseph, But Benjamin, one of the only of the righteous, whose children, his offspring, make it into the New Testament. Okay. What about, what about Joe? Let's let's just do Joseph real quick. What about Ephraim and Manasseh? Who's the firstborn? Manasseh. Who's the second? When it comes time to bless the children, the Bible says that Joseph brings his children before his father. It's time to give the blessing, and Manasseh is on his right, and Ephraim's on his left. And the custom was to take your right hand and put it on the elder and bless him. And Jacob crosses over and he, bla- he puts his arm on Ephraim instead. And then Joseph tries to stop him. He says, Dad, you put your hand on the wrong person. And he says, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. And he blesses Ephraim instead of Manasseh. Strange. What about the sons of Jesse? What about, what about Jesse's kids? Anybody remember who the oldest was? What about the youngest? David. Who becomes king? It's not the oldest. It's the youngest. I could do this all day through the Old Testament, but I won't. I want you to get this principle in you. There's a problem with the firstborn. All throughout humanity, there's a problem with the firstborn. And then Jesus comes. You know, Paul said in Romans, he's trying to tell us the story about why Jesus had to be a man. And he tells us that it was because of one man's disobedience to sin entered the world. And it was by the, another man that obedience became restored, that our relationship became reconciled. And in 1 Corinthians 15... He calls this guy the last Adam. Now, why would he do that, Brother Snow? 
The truth of the matter is you've got to understand something, that the reason why you were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and the reason why in your flesh dwells no good thing, and the reason why all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it was because of the firstborn in humanity, Adam. And then there comes one named Jesus, who lives this perfect life, image of the invisible God, called the Son of God. He lives, he dies, and he's raised in glory. And the writer here in 1 Corinthians The writer here in Colossians says that he's the firstborn of every creature. So you might think of it this way. Your blood was tainted by the firstborn naturally. But when the new new firstborn came, the firstborn was redeemed. In other words, your bloodline's been purified because of Jesus. In other words, things have been set at right because of his redemption. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 16 is the reminder, though. So 15, he said, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And verse 16 gives us the reminder, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, that are visible, that are invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. In other words, God said it from the very beginning that the same God who created everything that you see and the same God who made the heavens, the same God who created heaven and earth and divided the waters and the same God who made all that we see in front of us and created you and me, that same God said, I love my people too much to let them share in a devil's fate when I've created them for dominion. Satan's fate was set from the beginning when he, when he disobeyed God. But Satan, he can't be redeemed. But you and I, his image in the earth, the Bible says that God put a plan together. And this is why Jesus could walk around in the earth and say things like, He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father? Believest not thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Jesus walked this earth restoring the image of the one who created you and created me. And he did it by fixing what was messed up that day. The work of Jesus Christ was a work of restoration. It was restoring a disfigured image that had been broken into pieces since the beginning. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Notice verse number six. It said, who being in the form of God. And then in verse number seven, what's it say? He took upon him the form of a servant. Form of God and form of a servant, all in one. That's a oneness thing for another day. And was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." So this whole thing begins with an image. He's trying to restore an image in the earth that's been messed up. He's trying to restore the image that man marred. And thank God, because you and I certainly couldn't do it. There was no chance. I'd had a Bible study with a young man today, and we were talking about this. It doesn't matter how good you live your life. It doesn't matter if you followed the law to a T. It doesn't matter if you obeyed every moral commandment. If you have not been baptized into Christ, you have not yet put on Christ. And if Christ is not in you, then you don't have the hope of glory. It is all a work of Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice something. The prophecy in Genesis was what? Enmity between thy seed and her seed. Fair enough. And that he, they, it, would bruise your head. But then he says something interesting. He says, it will bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel. Not their heel, not its heel, his heel. I was reading Isaiah this week, thinking about verse number 15 in Genesis 3. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
his heel. You see, there's a difference between the it and the his here. I don't mean to telegraph it to you, but you had better know the answer to the question in this passage, who is the his that we're talking about? Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 3. The Bible says that he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. Genesis 3 and 7 said that the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. In verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. Isaiah in his prophecy is not just telling us about the Savior that was to come, but the reason why he had to come at all. And in the 53rd chapters, he begins to describe the Messiah. He pauses to remind us that before he was ever born, we knew him once, somewhere. We knew this one that was to come. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. But he knew us, and we knew him. And then in 53 and 4, I love this. He said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried away our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You have to understand something. He made us to be like him. But when we went astray and took upon ourselves the image of corruption, God said, I'll take upon myself the form of a servant and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why? Because you are made in the image of God and God loves you so much that he will not let you share in the fate of devils when he made you for dominion. He's not going to let you share in the fate of the wicked. He made you to have authority and dominion in the earth. And so the scripture says that he's despised and rejected of men. And then it says that he was bruised for my iniquity. He was bruised for me. Well, why would he have to be bruised for me? Because we're the problem since the very beginning of this thing in the book of Genesis. We introduced the problem, but he said, even though they can't be the solution, I love them too much to let them stay where they're at. So I'll step into time and be the solution. And when God spoke to the serpent and he said, yeah, he's going to bruise your head, but you're going to bruise his heel. He knew exactly what he was speaking of. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20, the Bible says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man is in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put, all, put down all rule and authority and power. And I love this, verse 25. For he must reign. Till he hath put all enemies where? He's going to, they, <laughs> Genesis chapter number three. Since the beginning of time, God set it in order. He's, it's going to bruise your head. But you're going to bruise his heel. Because when Jesus came, he did not just come to restore his image. He also came to take care of a serpent problem. He came to take care of a snake-bitten humanity. A humanity that could not redeem itself. The Bible says that when he came in and stepped into time, was bruised for our transgressions and put all things under his feet. And the story of redemption is how that Christ redeemed the image of God in the earth. Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 7. I'm coming to a close. Revelation 12 and 7. A familiar reading. I want you to understand something, though. Something about this crushing of the serpent. There's something about this, this story of the one who was going to come that was going to put the enemy under his feet. John saw it in the book of Revelation, but what's funny is he didn't see it in the past. John saw exactly the same thing, but he didn't see it as something that had already happened. 
I suppose it's already happened, depending on what you think about eternity and time. But it wasn't something that had happened in his past. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible said there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. John saw something coming one day, hopefully not very long from now, when all the saints are gathered together and there's one final wrapping up, there's one final destruction of that, oh, I love that phrase, that old serpent, the devil, that old serpent that we call Satan. He said one day he's going to be cast out for good. And those that he has been accusing for generations, and you and I are certainly in that category. How many times he stood, bef stood before God accusing you, LG, saying he can never make it. Have you seen what he did yesterday? Have you seen what Cade was doing? Have you seen, oh, have you seen how Liam talks to his parents? Have you seen, have you seen how Brother Snow, have you seen how his face been shaking? Come on, don't you see, God, that they're not good enough? Don't you, why are you wasting your time with them? I won this battle way back in a garden. I won this battle way back when Eve took that fruit, and all the while, John saying don't believe it for a second because one day he's going to be bound up and cast down one last time and the bible says when that day comes they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony your testimony is what's going to be the final answer to this whole thing that when i could not save myself he stepped down into eternity and took upon himself the form of a servant for me i don't have to be good enough brother snow he came to earth on my behalf he overcame the serpent for me. He overcame my faults for me. He took the victory in his hand to keep me out of that devil's fate. Music can come. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I love this. Paul is trying to encourage his people. I, I want to leave this with you. This is the, the greatest encouragement you'll find in the New Testament, in my opinion. Paul is writing to the church. He says, I want you to understand something about that day. That accuser that stands before God, that old serpent, all day and all night. The Bible says that he day and night stands there accusing. And God just turns his ear off to it because he knows he has but a short time. He's a liar and the father of lies. There is no truth in him. Understand something. If you struggle with the accusations that the adversary throws against you, just remember he is a liar and the father of them. And the only reason why he accuses you is because you're one of the brethren that the Bible says not very long from now is going to stand up on that day and say, I've got the blood of the lamb and I've got the word of my testimony. So you go there and I'll go here. I'm going to spend an eternity with my God. 1 Corinthians 14 Excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15 and 42. Paul is writing about the resurrection. He said, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in a natural body, and it's raised in a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man, I said the second man is the Lord. You want some oneness, there you go. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And he said that the second man who is the Lord from heaven, he said, as is the earthy, so are they also which are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so are they which are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, as we have borne the image of the corrupted, 
as we have borne the image of the dishonor, as we have borne the image of shortcomings, as we, as we have borne the image of failure, and as we have borne the image of fault, and we have borne the image of fracture, and we have borne the image of sin, he says, so as we have borne the image of the earthy, so also, not very long from now, we will bear the image of the heavenly. From Genesis to Revelation, this whole thing has been about one story. That God loved you too, made, it, made you in his image, loved you too much. Loved humanity too much to let his image spend an eternity in a devil's hell. So his promise was that while it may have been sown in corruption in the garden, I'm going to raise it to incorruption. And while it may have been sown in dishonor through disobedience, one day it's going to be raised to honor. And even though they've borne the image of the earthy, and even though they've failed me, and even though they've messed up, and even though they've walked away from me, I'm telling you that in Christ everything is a new creature. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. We didn't have to get it all together, but he said, I know my people, I know my people are fallen and fractured and broken now. But one day they will bear the image of the heavenly. Stand with me. And if he had left it there, I would have been happy enough. If he had left it at that, if he had just left it at, okay, in this life, in this life, I can find restoration. In this life, I can find healing. In this life, I know that I'm not, I'm not doomed to corruption, but that's not where he leaves it. Verse 50, he said, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. That's why you need the Holy Ghost, by the way. In verse 51, he said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption this mortal shall put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory death is swallowed up in victory verse 55 oh death where is thy sting oh grave where is thy victory the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something, that if you are in this place, if you are in this place and you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, and you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, I don't question for a moment that you're sincere. I don't question for a moment that you have a love for the things of God. But I want you to know something. This, is, this whole thing, it's not just about belief. And it's not just about how you think. And it's not just about your day-to-day -day life. This is about corruptible human nature putting on incorruption. This is about mortality putting on immortality. This is about the things that are temporal putting on the things that are eternal. And it's only by His Spirit, only by His Spirit, that we can be raised to incorruption. And Paul gave us a promise. He said, there is coming a day when all things are put under His feet. Corruption is put on incorruption. He said, it'll be in that day that we can say the song, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Because our Lord Jesus Christ had put it all under his feet. If you're thankful for that, I wish that you would raise your hand wherever you are right now. Close your eyes. God, more than anything. I want to be made in your image, God. God, put me back into your likeness. God, I pray that your spirit begin to tug at the hearts of your people tonight. God, that you begin to reach for somebody, God, vacillating between the borders, vacillating between the boundaries. God, I speak against every lying spirit, God, that would speak into the hearts of your people, that would lie in our ears and say that all things are fine the way that they are, that everything in my life is as it should be. God, I know, I know, I know without you, I am still corrupted. God, without you, I have no life. Without you, God, I have no hope. God, I believe that your spirit is speaking to us even in this place right now. I wish that you would link up with somebody that's near you right now and begin to pray that prayer. God, I'm looking for the day that this corruption is going to put on incorruption. God, I'm looking for that day, God, when all things are going to be made new. 
God, I'm going to continue to press toward the mark of the high calling. I refuse the lie of the adversary, God. I refuse the lies of the wicked that speak in my ear, telling me I'm not going to make it. God, I refuse the lies of the accuser that stand before you day and night, saying I can't do it, saying that I'm not going to be there that day, that I'm not going to make it into your eternity. God, I speak against that accuser of the brethren that would lie in the ears of your people to discourage them. God, I pray that the encouragement of the Holy Ghost would sweep over this place, that you're faithful to finish every work that you start. God, the, what you've spoken into my life, God, the things that you have promised me will come to pass. And if your word tells me, God, that by your spirit I can be redeemed, then I believe that I am redeemed. And if your word tells me that by your name and by your blood I'm set free, then I'll believe I am set free indeed. Across this place, can we thank the Lord for the word that we have heard tonight? Thank you, God, for speaking to us through your servant. I'm so thankful tonight that Jesus did what I could never do, and he gave me a hope that Satan will never have. Amen. I'm thankful for his sacrifice and for the opportunity afforded to us here tonight. Amen. If you're still praying, please continue to pray. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, we have water. We will baptize you before you leave this place tonight. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us in this place. One more time, can we thank Brother Gill and the Lord for the word that we heard tonight. Amen. Just a reminder, there will be no prayer meeting here tomorrow night. Uh, please find a place and a time to pray with your families. And we will see you back here in the house, Lord, on Sunday morning. God bless you. Go in Jesus' name.